Do you remember a couple of decades ago when people liked to blame movies and music for the vile acts some people committed? It always comes back to Ted Bundy, doesn't it? He is such a good example to use, a great comparison because the case of old Ted is pretty rich. Ted Bundy gave the world one last fuck you before he was executed. He told the man interviewing him that porn was to blame. He deflected the blame away from himself. It wasn't because of porn that Ted became such a vicious monster. He might have helped fuel some of his fantasies. But the only one to blame is Ted himself. But let's forget about Ted for a minute. But keep the topic in mind, because it ties in well with the man who sits in the spotlight for today's first feature, Heinrich Pomerink, also known as the Beast of the Black Forest. It was on July 6, 1937 that Heinrich Pomerink was born. He was a little creep from the start. He was one of those lonely kids who liked to look at the girls in school at a very young age. As a matter of fact, he claimed to have first seduced and had sex with a girl when he was only 10 years old. As Heinrich got older, his sexual thoughts and compulsions began consuming his every waking moment. His fantasies were getting violent, sadistic. Before Heinrich became the beast, he was another kind of monster. A serial rapist. As the fantasies grew more intense, young Heinrich had to act out. He would hang outside dance halls and when a young girl came out from the entrance, he would immediately proposition her for sex. But his blunt and creepy manner would often earn him a solid no. He was like a heroin addict, asking for a fix. But whether the girl said yes or no, young Heinrich was going to get his fix, one way or another. When the girls inevitably said no to Heinrich, he would follow them. He would look out for an opportunity to attack, and if the opportunity arose, he would beat the girl into submission and rape her before fleeing the scene. The rapes, however, began catching attention from the law. So after a string of rapes in his hometown of Mecklenburg, he moved along to Hamburg. It didn't take too long for him to begin his rape spree there as well, and he added another element to the assaults as well. He would rob the women who raped. But the same thing happened in Hamburg, and he had to flee once again. This time he fled to Switzerland, and just like one might guess, he resumed his occupation as a deviant sexual predator, but he wasn't as lucky in Switzerland. Well, he was kind of lucky because he only got caught for one rape and served four years in a Swiss prison before being thrown out of the country. Nothing could clench his thirst though, nothing would deter him. As he was released and extradited in 1957, he began traveling around Austria and Germany. For two years he kept up his habit, his addiction of rape and robbery. He had hurt a lot of people by 1959, but he hadn't committed murder. Yet. It was in the spring of 1959 that Heinrich Pomerink went to see a new movie that had been released. It was The Ten Commandments. And the movie enraged Heinrich. He would later testify that he had seen the women dancing around as a fickle lot, and that he then and there had felt the compulsion to begin his killing spree. But like I said earlier, it's not the movie's fault that he became a serial killer. All the signs were there. All he needed was a psychological trigger. And if it hadn't been the Ten Commandments, I can promise you that it would have been something else. Porn my ass. Heinrich began his hunt immediately. He went out strolling around on the streets, stalking in the night looking for a suitable victim, and he would find one. But the first woman he attacked with intent to kill got away. A taxi drove by at the right moment and it saved the woman's life because it caused Heinrich to flee the scene. But he still had to satisfy his urges and now he was frustrated as well. He continued his hunt that night until he encountered 49 years old Hilde Konter. He dragged the woman into the bushes where he raped her. Then he began hacking and slashing through her throat, leaving a messy and horrendous scene behind. A month later he attacked 18 year old Karin Velde. He dragged her to the river embankment where he raped her, and then he bashed her skull in with a stone. After he was done with the body, he threw her across the riverbank, leaving her brutalized and mutilated body there to be found. On June 1st, 1959, not too long after his first murder, Heinrich was traveling on a train. There he spotted 21-year-old Dagmar Klimed 
sleeping in one of the carriage compartments. He silently entered, closed the door behind him and attacked her. Once he had raped Dagmar, he opened the window and threw her out of the train. But Pomerenko wasn't satisfied yet. He pulled the train brake to exit the train and ran back to the spot where Dagmar had landed. She was still alive, but she was injured. She was bloody and several bones in her body was broken. The pain must have been pulsating all through her body. It was while she was in this state, laying severely injured by the train tracks that Heinrich again raped the young woman. After that he stabbed her several times in the back, killing her. Heinrich Pomerenk was a fucking monster. Only a week later he attacked 16 year old Rita Walterbacher. This time he strangled his victim and instead of raping her before he decided to rape her after she was dead. That's three murders. But bodies kept turning up around the Black Forest area in Germany. In only the span of a few months, seven more corpses, all young women, would turn up brutalized and raped. Some before they died, some after they died. Hearing the story of Heinrich makes you feel sick. But for the beast of the Black Forest himself, he was on top of the world. He had during this time also attempted but failed several murder attempts. He had attacked two English tourists who were saved by people passing by. He had beaten a young woman with a tire iron to within an inch of her life and he had stabbed two women in the neck, but luckily they survived. It was in 1960 as he was visiting the town of Hornburg that he fucked up. He had purchased a suit to be made from the tailor at his previous visit to the town and as he saw his new elegant suit, he got so excited he wanted to wear it right away. As he changed into his new clothes, he put his old clothes in the suitcase and left it in the care of the tailor. But the tailor noticed something. He saw the butt of a rifle sticking out of the suitcase and fearing that Heinrich would come back to rob him, he contacted police. And the police were right there waiting for Heinrich as he returned. Heinrich had gained his income by robbing people. And the robberies were quickly linked to Heinrich thanks to a footprint he had left at a recent robbery. But police felt that something was off about Heinrich, that he might be responsible for more than just robbery, so they tricked him. They told him that they had found blood on his clothes, linking him to one of the brutalized corpses found around the Black Forest area. And that was all it took to get Heinrich Pomerang to start yapping. He admitted to 10 murders. Even though he had committed to 10, he was charged with 4 murders, 12 attempted murders and 21 rapes, and that was enough. Heinrich Pomerenk was sentenced to 140 years in prison on October 22nd, 1960. Only about a year and a half after his murder spree had begun. The Beast of the Black Forest, the Ten Commandments killer, lived a long life behind Boris, but eventually died of leukemia in 2008. And that was the end of that fucking monster. We won't be traveling too far from Germany in our second feature. However, we will travel back in time. Approximately one century before the Beast of the Black Forest began his brutal killing spree in Germany, there was another serial killer to the southwest, in France. On February 5th, 1855, two women were approached by a large, heavyset fella in the French city of Lyon. The first one was Marie Cart, a young lady, looking for some work. The man presented her a proposition. He lived in a house out in the country with his mistress, and she was looking for him to hire a maid for her. But Ricard told the very large man that she would have to think about it, that she couldn't give him an answer right away. But the big man wasn't really just looking for a maid, he was looking for a target, and on that day, he would find one. The second girl approached that day was Marie Badet. Unlike Miss Cart, Badet accepted the man's offer and told those who knew her that she had been offered a job out in the country. Three days went by. February 8, 1855, a very large group of sportsmen running among the thickets and branches outside the small town of Montluel would be the ones to discover the bruised and battered corpse of Marie Badet. She had been stripped naked and dumped. Her killer had strangled her with what seemed to be a rope and it seemed as if her killer had displayed a large amount of rage during the attack. Another sadistic monster. They're everywhere. They always have been, and they always will be. 
The monster this time was Martin Dumoulard. He was approaching many young girls to work for him between the years of 1855 and 1861. He would lure them to go with him with an offer of work and good living. Some of those he approached disappeared, some of them declined because of his subtle creepiness, and some of them went to go with him, but managed to escape his violent attempts. One of those girls was Olympe. You see, Martin had reached out to Marie Cart once again, the woman who had told him she needed time to think that day, but she declined. Feeling bad about the rejection, she told him that she had a friend, another young lady, named Olympe, that was interested in the offer. Martin Dumoulard contacted Olympe, and together they took a train out to the country. After some time, he said that they had to walk the rest of the way, and it was at some point during this venture that his demeanor changed. It's not specified exactly what he did, but something caused Olympe to flee the large threatening man. She fled to a house banging at their door, and they let her in. She told the story, she didn't have any details like a name or an address, and the police, faced with the prospects of investigating the claims of a panicked young maid, simply shoved the case aside. It would take a while before they would look at the case more seriously. In the time that followed, Martin Tom Lord had tried to lure four more victims out to his country house, but three of them had the sense to escape and find help. Yet, the authorities still didn't seem to do anything. The fourth also got away, not because she fled, but because Martin himself fled. They had been traveling on foot when they met two other travelers. Not wanting to take the risk, Martin, who was carrying the young woman's bag, simply ran away and took her possessions with him. Six years went by. Servant girls had been going missing, claiming to their relatives and friends that they had been offered work out in the country. No one had seen them after that. So by 1861, it was clear to law enforcement that something was going on. That's when they caught their break. Another young lady had managed to escape Martin Dumoulard. She was bruised, scratched, her dress was torn up and her shoes were missing. She was desperately banging at the door of one of the homes in a small village of Balan. As she got to talk to authorities, she told them of what had happened. A large man, about 50 years old, a scar above his lip had approached her on the road. He had offered her work and she had accepted. Together the two had taken a train out to the country. As they reached their station, the man told her that they would have to walk the rest of the way. He offered to carry her bag and off they went. After a while though, the man began acting weird. He told the young lady that he couldn't carry the bag any longer, so he hid it among the bushes, telling her that he would come back and get it later. Then as the walk went on, he kept trying to pick up things. He tried to yank a fence pole out of the ground at one point, and at another point he attempted to pick up a big rock. The young lady felt increasingly threatened by the bizarre behavior the man displayed, so she told him that she had reconsidered the offer and wanted to leave. Before she knew what was going on, the man had taken out a noose. He threw it around her throat, and just as he was about to squeeze, the girl managed to break free. She caught him off guard, and she began running. It was very dark outside at that point, so she kept falling over. This is how she lost her shoes, and how she managed to get so scratched up. The large man was running after her for a while, until she reached the village. Now the police was actually looking, and their eyes turned towards the small village of Hamlet in Dumoulard. Dumoulard seems to have been a very usual name there, but there was two particular people in the area that interested detectives. A man and a woman, Martin Dumoulard and Marie Dumoulard. The man, Martin, fit the description perfectly fine, so detectives made their move and they arrested the huge sulking man without too much of a fuss. A search of the house turned up a lot of damning evidence, a lot of clothes that had belonged to the missing servant girls, and many of them were stained with blood. It was time for a confession. There seems to have been at least six victims that could be attributed to Martin Dumoulard and his accomplice, Marie Dumoulard. Marie hadn't killed anyone, but she knew what he was doing, and she appreciated the raw possessions Martin brought home. First of course is Marie Bidet, the young woman he had picked up in Lyon back in 1855. Three of his victims had been unknown, what we today would call Jane Doe's. Their skeletal remains had been flung into the river and had bore similar signs of violence as Marie Bidet, bruised, battered and strangled. There was another nude corpse, another Jane Doe that had been found in the woods. She too had suffered a horrible fate, lured into the woods at night 
beaten and strangled to death. Then there was another young girl named Marie, Marie Bosseau. Just like the others, she was found in the woods, stripped, beaten, strangled. Martin Damoulard put the blame on two unknown accomplices though. He claimed that these two mysterious men had taken the girls away in the night and then returned with possessions and valuables. But no one bought it, and the large man also spoke of a few other girls that had gone missing. He told the same story about them. He brought the girls to his accomplices, who had taken the girls away. When asked about his last attempted murder, the girl who ran away bloodied and bruised through the woods, he simply said that his accomplice had failed to show up that night, that he never had intended to harm her. I think it's clear that Martin was full of shit, and the number of victims was clear to be much higher. The issue there seems to be that only the remains of six girls were found. But the amounts of possessions and clothing found in the Dumbledore house pointed towards many more, maybe as many as about 16 or 18 victims, and he also told stories of girls he had given to these two mysterious men who never existed, girls that were missing but was never found. He couldn't be charged for those, but the implication is clear. Martin Dumbledore killed more than six young servant girls, between 1855 and 1861, and his wife didn't seem to mind at all. She was more of an accomplice and enabler than just a bystander. Martin kept insisting that he was innocent, but no one with more than one fucking brain cell in their head could believe him. His execution was swift and very religious, as the axe flung down on his neck and separated his head from his shoulders. Marie de Moulard wasn't executed, but she was imprisoned, it just goes to show that serial killers have existed for a very, very long time. Tom Lord preyed on his victims three decades before Saucy Jack, Jack the Ripper, caught attention in London. It has been a treat bringing in two more cases, two more features. Today they were European. But until next time, I hope you have enjoyed today's double feature.